In this video, we're going to be learning how to convert a Fisher projection to an average projection. So remember, the Fisher projections are your open chain projections, and the Hayward projection is going to be the cyclic forms of the sugars. Now, in an aqueous solution, you only have a trace amount of uh, open chain or Fisher projections. For the most part, the sugar is going to be existed in the cyclic form, and that's what we're going to learn how to convert the open to the cyclic form and then eventually we're going to be talking about what an alpha and a beta anomer is. Now if you have a six-membered sugar or a five-membered sugar you could make either a six-membered ring or a five-membered ring depending on what type of uh, functional group you have. So suppose if you have an aldohexose, so aldohexose will have an aldehyde group and in when it cyclizes, it's going to make in a six-member ring, and the, another name for a six-member ring in that particular case is going to be the pyranose. And if you have an aldopentose or a ketohexose, they both tend to make a five-membered ring, and that's going to be called a furanose. That's just the common names for those rings, and those rings are all going to have one oxygen in there. Now, how that really happens, reaction between the hydroxyl or the OH of your the last chiral center and the carbonyl group. And I'll, I'll show you the picture here so that it can, you can clearly see how that's happening in there. So let's uh, look at this particular example here. I have a D-glucose here, and we're going to make a cyclic form of that. The first step is going to be to rotate your sugar clockwise 90 degrees. So when I rotate this, I can just copy this down here. So when I rotate it, it's going to look like this. And to make it a little bit nicer, I can probably just uh, rewrite those in the pro proper orientation. So you're going to have an H there, an OH there, H there, and an H there. And then I can do the same thing on the bottom. It's got an OH there, OH there, H, and OH there. So then when I number these, this is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then since your last chiral center that's going to be furthest away from your carbonyl is going to be number 5, so it's, I'm going to call this 5 prime here. This oxygen atom is going to be the one that's going to be attacking. So star, put a star there and put a star right there. So that oxygen is going to be the one that's going to be attacking that carbonyl to make a cyclic chain. Now make sure I have this oriented properly so that it can attack. So I'm going to make in the form of a six-membered ring. So start out from here. So if this is my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and that's going to be 6 so far. And obviously you know at 1 you got this carbonyl group. And then orient your H and OH just like how you see it here. So in number 2, your H is pointed up and your OH is pointed down. In number 3, your OH is pointed up and H is pointed down. On number four, your OH is pointed down and H is pointed up. And number five, just like how you have it here so far, the OH is pointed down, H is pointed up. And then this is this is going to be number six right there, CH2OH. And remember, if I change the color here, the OH on the number five, this OH and this carbon right there, they are going to be the one that's going to be attacking one another to make a cyclic six-membered pyranose ring. Now, they're not really at the proper orientation, or you can say they're, the OH is not closer to that carbonyl. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this part of the molecule. So when I rotate it, this kind of comes up here, and this kind of comes down here, and this, carb uh, this hydrogen is going to come down here. So when I rotate it, then you'll have this uh, properly oriented. So let me copy that down. And I'll raise just a part of it. So 
So now you have this properly oriented where the OH is right next to your carbonyl group and the other CH2OH is going to be on the top and your hydrogen is going to be on the bottom. So now at this point what's going to happen this oxygen is going to be doing a nucleophilic attack. I'm not really going to talk about the mechanism but just roughly that's does a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl. This comes out and you make a cyclic ring. So I'll just go ahead and make a cyclic ring now instead of just going through the mechanism. All right, so this is my cyclic ring and I'm gonna have an oxygen right there. So just keep the colors to be same. So that's your oxygen right there. And then this is going to be one, two, three, four, five. And then your six is going to be pointed to the top. So let me just go in and write down all of them. So this is CH2, OH there, H there. And then on number four, you're going to have the OH pointed down, H pointed up. On number three, you have the OH pointed up, the H pointed down. And number two, you have the OH pointed down. H pointed up. Now, when you you're gonna making you're gonna be making another hydroxyl group at carbon number one here, and when you do make a new hydroxyl group, this hydroxyl group has two options. It could be either down or it could be up. So what that really means, I could have this OH pointed down. That's one way of having that position, or I could have that pointed up. So I'm just going to copy down. So there, it has it doesn't really have a 50-50 shot, but it has uh, almost a 50-50 shot where the OH and the H could be either pointed down or the up. So when you get this, you kind of get two different types of isomers. Now everything else is kind of oriented same way going from two, three, four, five. It's only going to be the position at the first carbon. So this first carbon is going to be called an enomeric carbon. Now if your OH is pointed down in this particular case, the way you tell whether it's going to be an alpha or a beta, if your OH is pointed down like we have here, so in reference to your CH2OH, so those are the two groups you're going to be looking into when you're trying to figure out whether you have an alpha or an a beta anomer. So if they are trans to one another where OH is pointed down and the CH2OH is pointed up, so they are trans to one another or opposite to one another, then you call that alpha anomer. So we know this is going to be in a D-glucose. And since it's in D-glucose, it's on the top of that, it's an alpha. So I'm going to write down alpha D glucose. And on the bottom one, if your OH and the CH2OH, they're pointed in the same direction, they're both kind of pointed up, then, or they both could be pointed down, as long as they are cis to one another or they're both in the same direction, you get, that's going to be your beta anomer. So this is going to be the beta uh, D glucose. Now, Remember, we started off with an D glucose. If I go back here, because your last chiral hydroxyl group at the last chiral carbon is going to be on the right side, and that's how you know it's a D glucose. But let's say if you are actually given an Hayward projection, how would you really know if it's an D sugar or an L sugar without kind of opening it up and going back to the open chain? You can easily tell by the position of your CH2OH group. If the CH2OH group is pointed up, like in this case, then it's going to be a D sugar. If that CH2OH is pointed down, in that case it would have been in the position of this H right there, then it would have been an L sugar. So that's how you tell, looking at the position of this uh, methyl hydroxyl group, if it's going to be in a, a D sugar or an L sugar. This alpha and beta anomer in terms of uh, how much you have in aqueous solution, 
the alpha animer is actually going to be about 34% and this beta animer is going to be 64%. So they can go back and forth among one another. So if you do make some alpha animers and it can kind of go back and make a beta animers and same can be said for the beta animers going back to the alpha animers. But in terms of the stability, you can say that since you have 64% beta glucose there, it's going to be more stable. And uh, you can convert one alpha to beta and reverse by just opening up the ring and closing back up because when you close back up, it's got a 50-50 shot on what type of uh, animal it's going to make. And that particular process is called an immune rotation. So let me talk about what immune rotation is. So if I have, let me just copy these down here. So if I have an alpha animer, I can first of all open it up. So what I really have to do to open it up, I will get to break this bond right there. So when we break this bond, I can probably just copy this thing down again and just have this broken up. So when I break this bond, it's also going to have uh, this right there, this carbon one kind of gone back to the carbonyl group. And you're going to have an OH there. So when you close this back in and it can go back either again, the alpha or the beta, and that's how you can convert uh, the alpha to the beta and back and forth. So it's not only going to be making an beta, it could also make the alpha animer back again, but it could also make the beta animer. So if you're trying to convert a bunch of your alpha animers to the beta, uh, you got to first open up the ring, and then when you snap back again, you will be making some alpha again, but then you're also going to be making a lot of betas. So that's just the uh, interconversion between the alpha animer to the beta animer is just called the meter rotation. Okay, so let's talk about another sugar. Let's, this is the L fructose I have. So I'm going to try to do this one quickly. So first of all, go ahead and rotate this by 90 degrees. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then you're going to have an OH at the 5 prime there. So this particular group right there at uh, number five, at car, uh, center five, and the carbonyl at number two, they are going to be the one that are going to be attacking a one another to make a, in this case, a five member ring, so that it makes a furanose ring. And then if I try to orient those, And a five member ring, so this is going to be uh, two, three, four, five, and six right there. So at the two, you're going to have the carbonyl, obviously, and then this CH2OH on the top is still there. So let me move this back a little bit. And then on number three, you can clearly see the OH is pointed down. So you want to have that pointed down. On number four, the OH is pointed up. So now on number five, you can clearly see how I have this OH pointed up, the H is pointed down. And then what I really did, I placed the CH2OH there. So that's going to be your number six. But remember, it's going to be this oxygen atom at the phi prime and this carbon that's going to be attacking one another so what I really got to do is just got to rotate this so when I rotate this I'm going to be making this coming down here and in that case this is going to come down here and this hydrogen is going to move up so when I do this all rotation so some of these positions are going to change so that you have uh, this OH properly oriented in order to attack 
the carbonyl of this ketone and then you're going to have the CH2OH on here and the H on here. So now what you can have is this OH is going to be attacking right there and this is going to come out and when this comes out it's going to have a chance of making this OH either going to the down or going to the top. So when I make a six, a five membered ring now oxygen is going to be at the fifth position. Once you made the five membered ring, go ahead and put down all your hydroxyl group and the CH2OH group there. So let's call on this carbon atom here, we're going to have the H going up, OH coming down, and this next carbon atom, the OH is going up, H is coming down on this Next carbon atom, you got the CH2OH going down and the H coming up here. And on this anomeric carbon, and this particular anomeric carbon is going to be called in a number two, and that's because of the reference that goes back to the open chain. So in the open chain, your hydroxyl carbon is going to be number one, and as a result, that still stays the same. So you could have this uh, CH2OH group either coming to the top or to the bottom. So let me just draw out in this particular case going to the top. So CH2OH and this is going to be called 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and then this is going to be 6 obviously. Even though it's a 5 membered ring and you would think okay this should have been called 1 but just to keep the reference to be the same with respect to the open chain fructose here you, your anomeric carbon is going to be the number two here. So this is your anomeric carbon. So that's the difference between um, the aldohexose and these uh, ketohexos uh, when you make a six member ring versus a five member ring there. So you're going to have an OH there and that's pretty much it. So like I said, you could make a uh, the second anomeric anomer as well. So when I make the second anomer, it's just going to be pointed down. So I'm just going to draw that down here. The difference is going to be the position of the OH is going to be pointed up now and the CH2OH is going to be down here and this should have been CH2OH here. And um, in order to identify which one is alpha and beta, so let's just go back and uh, focus on the position of the hydroxy group on the anomeric carbon with respect to the CH2OH group on the sixth carbon. So if I change the color here, I can clearly see this OH is pointed down here and then the CH2OH is also pointed down. And since they are assist to one another, this particular one is going to be a, a beta. So this is going to be beta L fructose. And then the second one, since you have the OH and this CH2OH, they are trans to one another, where one is pointed down, and the other one is pointed up. This is going to be your alpha L fructose. Okay, so then um, if it's a, if this was an uh, L fructose, uh, remember the, uh, from the Hayward possessions, you can tell based on the position of this particular group CH2OH if it's pointed down that tells you it's going to be an L form and if this was pointed up it would have been in a D form. So this is how you're going to be drawing these uh, conversion structures from linear to the cyclic. If you have any questions feel free to leave any comments in the section below.